When Final Fantasy VII Remake launched in 2020, it was a little polarizing, to say the least. Some fans of the original Final Fantasy VII weren't exactly thrilled with Square Enix's bold reimagining. It turned the first few hours of the 1997 game into a high-concept work of meta-art. It wasn't really a remake of Final Fantasy VII so much as it was a game about remaking Final Fantasy VII. That approach wasn't for everyone. But I'll tell you one person who did love it. It was me. Ever since playing it, Final Fantasy VII Remake has become one of my all-time favorite games. That's thanks to the ingenious way it tackles big questions on destiny and free will through a remake, something that itself is bound by a predetermined story. And now four years later, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth is here to follow up on that daring act with its own retelling of life outside of Midgar. Whether you hated Remake or think it's a genre-defining classic, I have great news for both of you. There's a very, very good chance that you're gonna love Rebirth, and I'll tell you why. Hi, I'm Giovanni Colantonio. I'm the gaming section lead here at Digital Trends, and I'm here with my review of Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Now, the action RPG sequel picks up where Remake left off. Having escaped Midgar and the grip of fate itself, Cloud and his eclectic eco-terrorist pals set out on a world-spanning journey to hunt down Sephiroth. The story sticks much closer to the original 1997 release this time. The crew follows a familiar sequence of events, from marching in a military parade to racing Chocobo at the Gold Saucer. For those who felt like Remake spit in their memories, Rebirth offers a much more faithful chapter that's bound to be more of a nostalgic crowd-pleaser. But that's not to say it doesn't mess with the original RPG, too. It's very much still a self-aware remake that's grappling with its own legacy and the weight of overprotective fan expectations. It's just doing so more inside the lines this time. Classic story moments are expanded to better tell a more emotionally resonant tale of heroes struggling to fight the grief, failure, and trauma of their past, and that past threatens to define their future. What's especially impressive here is how Rebirth is able to deliver such fully realized character arcs for every single party member. This time, the core quartet is joined by Red 13, Yuffie Kisaragi, and Kate Sith, who are all playable in the sequel. That sounds like a mosh pit on paper, but every single hero gets the time they deserve. Each character has a significant moment to face their past while building a relationship with one another. That's a testament to Rebirth's excellent script, which turns the hodgepodge center of the original RPG into a self-contained story that functions apart from Remake. Credit also goes to the voice cast here, who turn in terrific performances across the board. Brianna White gets more room to establish Aerith as a pure beacon of hope that's imperative to protect. John Eric Bentley is still terrific as Barrett, too, deftly moving between moments of comedic relief that's what I'm talking about. and genuine heartache. And newcomer Paul Tinto especially steals the show as the feline prince Kate Sith, making Final Fantasy VII's strangest character feel as human as anyone else in the party. And those human touches are crucial, because Rebirth's story can initially feel a lot harder to grasp than the hyper-focused remake. It hops around several plot threads over the course of 70 hours and takes its sweet time tying them all together. That can feel exhausting in the moment, but the slow burn narrative does pay off if you're patient. Now, in case you're wondering, Rebirth does not dance around the fact that most players and their mother know the fate of our heroes in the original story. And instead of obscuring that, it builds an incredibly tense story around it, one that puts players in the same headspace as Cloud and his companions. The end feels inevitable from the start, even if the future is technically unwritten, what hope is there that anybody could ever change anything? Rebirth's ultimate power comes in how much it rallies players to overcome that pessimism, and how it teaches them to keep pushing forward no matter what the final outcome is. Now, our heroes aren't fighting their personal demons alone. Among its wealth of loaded themes, Rebirth is also a tale about disparate friends forming a strong support system. Those bonds are crucial to weathering the emotional battles of the Final Fantasy VII universe, so the sequel bakes that into gameplay. While the core action RPG formula is largely unchanged from Remake, Square Enix makes several small tweaks here that give the entire sequel a greater sense of camaraderie. Let's look at its combat system. 
Rebirth features the same excellent action as its predecessor, cleverly paying tribute to the original's turn-based combat with action-freezing commands that can be executed from a menu in the middle of fast, real-time fights. It's still powered by a deep RPG system that has players creating perfect materia combinations for each ally. Skills have been tweaked, but the winning formula remains the same. Now what has changed is how characters now interact with one another rather than fighting as lone wolves in the same arena. By holding down a bumper, each character can access a selection of abilities that allow them to perform duo attacks with active allies. Those can entirely broaden each hero's playstyle. When I have Cloud active, I can have Barret shoot a bullet at his buster sword and deflect it into my foes from afar. The more I work with my partners, the more efficient and versatile we are together. And that's brought to an even greater conclusion with synergy abilities, which act as kind of tandem limit breaks. When Barrett and Kate Sith both have enough energy, they can team up and turn into a rotating merry-go-round of death. Those devastating bonus attacks can seriously turn the tides of battle, all while granting crucial support skills to allies. You don't just master individual characters in Rebirth. You build party relationships that make everyone stronger. I mean, heck, there's even a friendship bond system in this game. And every small detail has some thematic significance. I mean, compare the way party composition is handled between Remake and Rebirth. In the former, players never got to choose who was on their team. There was always a pre-selected trio going into each encounter, and that was a fitting decision for a game where our heroes were trying to fight for their free will. With Destiny now dead, players have full control over their team in most chapters. That makes Rebirth feel like a less restrictive adventure, offering players the freedom to build their characters through meticulous RPG customization. Now, freedom isn't just core to combat. The entire shape of Rebirth comes from that concept. Where Remake placed players in linear halls that reminded them how little control they had over their claustrophobic fate, Rebirth smartly opts for a more open-world approach. The vast planet is split up into six distinct biomes, each of which is a freely explorable space filled with checklist-driven map activities, side quests, and minigames galore. The almost overwhelming sense of adventure creates a perfect match for its now-dated predecessor, whose overworld ambitions feel smaller today than they did in 1997. Regions like Junon aren't just empty fields loaded with blank space, and that is a sin Final Fantasy XVI was kind of guilty of. They're richly detailed, with bits of environmental storytelling woven in that give a better sense of how the evil Shinra Corporation's planet-draining operations are littering the natural world. It also helps that Rebirth is a visual feat that takes full advantage of the powerful PS5. Every detail, from the dazzling neon lights of the Gold Saucer to the hilariously realistic dolphins of Junon, breathes new life into the world outside of Midgar, and at stable performance too. The almost like a dragon-esque approach to open world design has its pros and cons. A lot of effort went into crafting meaningful side content that builds out the eclectic attitude of the original. Some of those activities will keep players engrossed in entirely optional content. A wildly detailed piano-playing minigame has already won players over in Rebirth's demo alone, but the real star of the show is Queen's Blood. Yep, that's the RPG's Gwent equivalent, an in-world deck-building card game that gets its own massive side plot. It's absolutely fantastic, playing like a mix between Marvel Snap and Splatoon 3's Table Turf Battles and it allows Square Enix to paint a broader picture of life on Gaia. Seriously, I learned so much about the various cities and the local eccentrics in them by chatting before a thrilling round of cards. Now, the enormous collection of content also gives its composers plenty of opportunities to create memorable compositions that slot in among old classics. <laughs> ooh, 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 ooh. The end result is Frankly, astonishing. Rebirth features over 400 musical tracks, and there's hardly a dud in that bunch. The soundtrack effortlessly swings between heart-wrenching orchestral ballads and gleefully weird synth ditties that play whenever I have to escort a dog through the woods. I don't think I'm being overly effusive when I call it one of the all-time best video game scores. While there's a lot to love about Rebirth's awe-inspiring scope, its weakest moments come from those open-world ambitions, too. It can be an exhausting journey at times that refuses to quit while it's ahead. When I got to my fourth open area, the formula started to wear thin. Every single biome features the same exact checklist of simple activities. I can activate towers, I can find some hidden crystals, do a button-pressing memory minigame to gain summon data, fight through a list of simulated Chadley battles, and more. 
That formula doesn't change much from area to area, which turns exploration into a repetitive chore by the time you reach the lush jungles of Gongaga. And there's still so much more game after that point. Now that strain is further compounded by a handful of charming, but weak minigames. Some are easy enough to skip, like a clunky 3D brawling minigame in the Gold Saucer. Others, unfortunately, are tied to really important side stories. Intergrade's dreaded reimagining of Fort Condor returns here, and it's as frustrating as ever. But Rebirth one-ups that with a truly terrible robot tower defense minigame. I had already felt exhausted by the time I reached it, as I had felt compelled to check off as many open world activities as I could. That minigame was the straw that broke the camel's back, crushing my will to see it all. But look, I'm of two minds when it comes to Rebirth's bloated structure. Its glut of content can feel hollow at moments, dragging out a riveting story with hours of repetitive diversions. But even then, there's function in that structure. I think back to when The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild came out. At that time, I remember having a lot of conversations where friends told me that they refused to beat it. They simply weren't ready to leave a world that they loved so dearly, so they dedicated as much time as they could to completing every shrine or finding every Korok seed. As long as they never fought Calamity Ganon, they could stave off the inevitable credits roll forever. And I had that same feeling playing Rebirth, but not because I didn't want to put down a game I loved. I feared what awaited me in its final chapter. There's an ever-present dread that hangs over Rebirth, even in its brightest moments. The possibility of a grand traumatic failure looms like thick smoke from a Shinra reactor. I was determined to change that outcome, but what if I couldn't? Would I be ready to accept that I can still be powerless in a world without fate? Maybe I'd never have to face that reality if I dedicated my life to chocobo racing or perfecting my Queen's Blood deck. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth leads both its heroes and players on a quest for self-acceptance. That's not something you can rush. We can't face our worst fears until we're ready to accept that our lives don't need to be defined by a singular success or failure. The future is unwritten, both our own and Cloud's. I mean, after all, we still have a trilogy to finish here, right?